Oh, nice. Okay, I saw that. Yeah. You mind if we get started? Let's go. All right. You better get down. You better get down. We will not recognize that. We will not recognize that when they graduate. This is great. There you go. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. That is awesome. Enjoy. We're going to help the state's economy. <laughs> If I could have everyone's attention. Good morning, all. I'm Tom Daschle, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this important meeting. Let me begin by thanking Kansas State for their extraordinary hospitality and the effort that they have made to make this two-day experience for us such a great success. I begin by thanking General Myers, President Myers, for the extraordinary effort he has made. Ron Turwin, Sue Peterson especially, deserve our thanks. I know they're in the room here somewhere. And we appreciate very much all of the effort that uh, you have made. Last night, we had the most enjoyable dinner at a fantastic venue. Uh, right on K-State's football field. And uh, yesterday, I think, was an outstanding prequel to the discussion we're going to have today. In many respects, K-State has become the Silicon Valley for biodefense. Your Biodefense Research Institute, the Kansas Intelligence Fusion Center, and now NRAP, NBAP, is just another example of what you've accomplished over the last 20 years and what most likely you're going to accomplish in even greater detail and success in the next 20. As a member of the bipartisan, emphasized bipartisan Blue Ribbon Defense Study Panel, I am very pleased to welcome each of you to this very important meeting this morning. We are especially pleased to have so many distinguished speakers, and we're very interested in hearing your comments and the statements and proposals that you make with us today. I know I speak for the entire panel, but especially our co-chairs, Governor Tom Ridge and Senator Joe Lieberman, in expressing their thanks to each of you for your participation. They are very interested in hearing about your comments and about what we learned today. The, bi the, 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 the Blue Ribbon Panel on Biodefense has an enormous appreciation of the threats and the impact that we are going to be talking today with regard to agriculture. We take those threats in agriculture very seriously. And so the recommendations and the comments that you make to us are going to be central as we consider our proposals that we will be offering at the end of this year. It was about a year and a half ago that we issued our first report. Our study panel's recommendations totaled 33 very specific ideas on ways with which to address biodefense in a comprehensive way. We're very pleased with the reception that these recommendations have had in Congress and in federal agencies. And in fact, even today, one of them, we can, we can say, has already become law. This request, the, the proposal we made to ensure that we create a national strategy around biodefense. One of the components of, of that strategy involves four central sectors of government, including the Department of Agriculture. The realization that agriculture is central is key to creating the kind of strategy and coordinated effort that is so important as we consider how we implement these recommendations and create a much stronger biodefense effort going forward. It will be critical for the Department of Agriculture to work with other agencies critical that we work within the, the, uh, the sector itself uh, as we consider the threats and the challenges we face going forward. 
my own experience over the last 20 some years occurred initially with my role as a member of the House and Senate Agriculture Committees. We have witnessed an enormous degree of, of, of an understanding and an, of, of, of general appreciation of that threat as we have uh, considered what has happened in our country. I had my own personal experience with anthrax uh, on October 15th of, 20, uh, of 2001. And the realization that these agents, anthrax and others, pose for, for agriculture generally are ones that we ought to take very, very seriously. Agriculture is nearly a trillion dollar sector in our economy, and the impact economically, socially, and in health, as we consider those threats as they pose today with regard to both livestock and grain are ones we ought to take very seriously. So as we consider the recommendations and as we consider the role of the Department of Agriculture in particular, one of the most critical decisions that we feel is so important is who's going to be making the effort to draw this organizational effort together? Who will actually be in charge? How can we implement uh, the recommendations in a way that will move from talk to action? And so as we consider today our, our role and the recommendations made, my hope is that we can really give some thought not only to how we do this, but, but how that implementation will actually take place. And so having your guidance on implementation and on the ultimate impact that these recommendations can have as we, as we consider these, these uh, strategies will be very, very critical. So we're anxious to hear from our, our guests today. Before we go farther, let me, uh, let me introduce Ken Weinstein, uh, one of the advisors to Homeland Security and somebody who's taken these issues very seriously, and, and I'm delighted that he could be with us today. Thanks, Senator Daschle. Appreciate that, and good to see everybody. I want to echo Senator Daschle's uh, thanks uh, to Kansas State University, to General Myers, uh, to all the folks who are here today and the experts who've gathered. Um, this looks to be a very informative um, and uh, an interesting day of, of sessions. Uh, as Senator Daschle said, I, um, I'm honored to be a member of this panel, and um, I think we're doing what is really you know, important work or, or working with the communities that are focusing on an important issue in terms of our national security. I look at, you know, there obviously the bio threat, there's the natural, naturally occurring side of it, and then there's the terrorism side. Because of my background, I tend to focus more on the latter, on the potential for a, a terrorist attack in the ag uh, and bio area. And um, I see this and the effort that is being made by so many people, including our panel, to really try to concentrate effort uh, against the threat in this area, similar to what we've been trying to do since 9-11 in so many contexts. And the touchstone of the effort here, as has been the case throughout the, the governments and the you know, government as in federal, state, and local governments' efforts since 9-11, the touchstone has been coordination. If there's one thing we found um, after 9-11 when we look back on why 9-11 happened, it was there were a variety of reasons. You know, there were a variety of governmental lapses, oversights, uh, but really what it was is a failure to coordinate the people who had the information that might have led to discovery of the plot and the people who had responsibility, operational responsibility to prevent that plot from coordinating fully and sharing information. And so we've seen since 9-11, whether it's getting the military to coordinate with the intelligence community um, in terms of sharing information and coordinating operations, or law enforcement, for instance, the FBI, where I used to work, sharing and coordinating with the Central Intelligence Agency and the rest of the intelligence community to focus on their, you know, the, the common target, which is international terrorists. Both of them are going after the same target, but often not in a coordinated fashion. Or the federal government coordinating with state and local governments uh, to make sure that, that they were sort of equipping each other with the information that was resonant in the hands of each to go after this, you know, uh, and pursue the threat. Same thing here in the bio area, and as you, to, 
sent that you've looked at our our initial report, one of the, the centerpieces of that report is recommendations to try to channel efforts and coordinate um, information sharing and efforts among the different and often disparate parts of the federal government and state and local governments that address the bio threat. And nowhere is that as important and as is the need as marked as in the ag area, where you have different players, as Senator Dash will reference, you've got the Agriculture Department, you have HHS, DHS, all working different elements of the threat and the, and the, the, um, the mission, but not often doing so in a harmonized way. And so today, I think, is a great example of the effort that's needed to try to coordinate those efforts so that we can make the strides that we made in so many other areas to prevent the next terrorist attack. I'm very happy and proud to be a part of this and look forward to the day. Thank you very much, Ken. Central to the effort here at K-State has been the leadership here at K-State. And uh, many of us have admired and respected General Myers for uh, many, many years. In my case, going back probably close to 15, 20 years. He has offered that same level of leadership and stature here at K-State, and we're honored and delighted that he could be with us this morning to make his welcoming remarks. General Myers. Thank you. Senator Daschle, thank you so much for the kind, the kind remarks. And Ken, welcome, and welcome to uh, everybody that considers uh, bioagri-defense such an important, uh, important topic for our country. Uh, first of all, uh, we do welcome people that travel all the way to Manhattan, Kansas. You found out that we do have airline service, so you can just fly right into Manhattan. Well, some of you did. Uh, you fly into Manhattan, or you can fly to Kansas City and make a very quick drive up through the beautiful Flint Hills eventually that Lead, uh, lead to Manhattan. I hope um, uh, our humble attempt to provide uh, creature comforts and, and comfort and everything you need has been adequate. If not, please tell us, and if we ever do this again, then we'll, we'll, we'll upgrade, our, upgrade our game. Um, we want to be good partners in the effort to protect our nation's uh, food supply, both plant and animal. Uh, we have, as people have seen, some, some expertise here and some facilities here that enable us to do that. And I will tell you frankly, it was one of the reasons when I finally applied for the full-time position of president of this great institution, in the back of my mind was, given my background, I thought I could be of some help in making sure that, that we are doing what we should be doing here at the university, this land-grant inst institution, uh, to support the efforts uh, that have come out in your recommendations as a, as a commission. Um, this is really important, whether it's uh, natural, as Ken mentioned, or um, somebody that wants to do us harm, uh, inspired by terrorism. Uh, it's, it's a real issue. Uh, some may not remember, but I, I became the chairman, took the oath uh, right after 9-11, 20 days after 9-11, and then seven days later, we're at war in Afghanistan. And when you start reading all the intelligence that was flowing in at that time, um, uh, extremists have lots of ways to try to get at us. And there has been a lot of experimentation in the areas that we're discussing here in, in, in the, the bio area. And, um, and there's been, there've been attacks. And Senator Daschle's been, been up close and personal with, with those attacks. So I think uh, those of us that have been able to, to study this and see this know there's a, an urgency here to try to protect our, our country's food supply, both from a health standpoint and then from an economic standpoint. And the other factor is, if something dramatic were to happen, um, you know, then fear takes over and then your confidence in government uh, diminishes a little bit. And when you're afraid, you kind of hunker down and you don't do much. It could be, it could be devastating. I think about after 9-11 and the folks that didn't want to fly after 9-11. And there are probably still some out there, I don't know, that will never fly again because the, the, the visual of an airplane running into a, a World Trade Center or, or um, crashing into a into uh, Pennsylvania uh, is just too vivid, or the Pentagon for that matter, where I was that day. So uh, we appreciate the fact you made the effort to come out here. We hope we've organized this okay, and, and, uh, and I look forward to today because I'm, uh, I have a lot to learn, and we're, we're, I'm learning every, every speaker. We have some great speakers lined up for today, some great panels. This will just be, I think, a fantastic day for me. So, so welcome. Uh, I got I to gotta point out Ron Truen and Sue Peterson, who uh, have 
been leading our effort uh, to, to put this day together. We have lots of others, but to Ron and Sue, thank you. Thank you very much. Sue is our um, Vice President for Legislative Affairs, an icon in Topeka, uh, an icon on uh, Capitol Hill. Everybody knows, everybody knows Sue, and uh, she's done such great work for us. And of course, Dr. Truen, uh, a lot of this area has been his life for a long time. And so, Ron, we, we appreciate both you and Sue for doing this. So, thank you. Thank you very much, President Myers. I, I said earlier that we feel very encouraged by the reception that our report and the recommendations have had among federal agencies and especially among members of Congress. One of the primary recommendations uh, that we made and that we'll continue to come back to is how do you accomplish this? How do you bring it about? How can we implement? How can we ensure that we move from talk to, to action? And that will be a central focus, not only in our discussion today, but I hope going forward. And one of the keys to whether or not we have just talk or more action will be what Congress does. And so it is fitting that as we begin this discussion today, that we are fortunate to have the Congressman uh, from the first district, Roger Marshall, with us today. Uh, Congressman Marshall was just elected and uh, already he brings a level of intelligence and commitment and passion to this issue. And we had an opportunity to talk a little bit last night and we are very honored and pleased that he could take time out of what we know is an incredibly busy schedule uh, to open this session to give us his thoughts. So Congressman Marshall, we invite you to come to the table and open up uh, with your comments and we'd be uh, very pleased to have a conversation with you following your statement. Thank Welcome. You. Thank you. Well, I too am honored to be here this morning to address this Blue Ribbon Study Panel on Biodefense. I want to welcome you to my alma mater, Kansas State University, where I received a bachelor's degree in biochemistry in 1982. I want to welcome you to the big first district of Kansas, which is the largest producing agriculture district in the country. When I was growing up, Kansas was known as the, uh, the breadbasket of the world. We literally grew more wheat in Kansas than any country in the world. To my surprise, I also found out that we're the number one producer of sorghum in the country. We had the fastest growing dairy herd in the country. We have a very vital cattle industry, pork industry. We also grow corn and soybeans. This is agriculture. Kansas is agriculture. Agriculture is Kansas. It's our economy. 60% uh, of the economy in my district is driven by agriculture. And certainly any threat to it is a threat to our existence. Want to pause just for a moment and, and introduce my staff here as well. I want to show you all and my alma mater my commitment to this district. And I always, my you know, coach used to say, don't tell me, show me. And I, I want to just share some of the people that are here representing us and will be very interactive. First of all is my legislative director, Kansas State graduate, Dalton Henry. And uh, Dalton is, um, has worked for U.S. Wheat, very, very familiar. Again, I think it's a big statement that my legislative director is ag-oriented. Katie Sawyer. Katie, where's Katie? Why don't you stand up? Uh, Katie has season tickets to K-State. <laughs> Her husband is a K-State graduate, so she's in charge of the state. And Blair Benedict is, is next. Blair is a Kansas State graduate. There's a theme here. Kansas State graduate that, that we uh, ran track together here and go way back. So Blair's kind of in charge of the Northeast District uh, as part of the state. And then Rebecca Swinder is next to him. Rebecca's from Garden City, also a K-State graduate. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, lastly, one of my pledge brothers, Mark Ayers. He's not officially worked for us, but Mark is a pledge brother, K-State beta with me, and is kind of my inside circle. He's one of those guys that'll tell me when I'm wrong and not afraid to say it. So certainly, uh, you know, I, there's a trail of people here to follow up on this. I think it's very fitting that we're in Manhattan, Kansas for this event today, both because it's the site of one of our nation's most forward-looking investments in biodefense research in BAF but also because Kansas has proven themselves in leading and preparing for potential outbreaks over the last eight years. 
We're so proud to have been awarded MBAF. We've embraced it and look forward to the next decade as we bring it online. What I'm very proud of is when I go back and see Mr. Pence again, and when I finally get to meet Mr. Trump, I'm going to be able to tell them that NBAF is on time and under budget at this point in time. I think it's very, very important. As you know, the president is very outcomes driven, and it's going to be good to say that we've been faithful with what you've given us so far. Whenever you're working on a subject as complex as biodefense, examples of success seem hard to find. I would like to formally recognize the leadership role that this group has assumed, and especially under Senator Daschle's leadership uh, on this important topic. And especially, you organize without any type of congressional or presidential mandate to do so. The consequences of us failing to properly prepare for an outbreak of a major disease could be catastrophic, whether the source of that outbreak is naturally occurring or intentional from a terrorist attack. Looking beyond potentially traumatic loss of life that can result from zoonotic diseases, the economic losses to our agriculture sector could be tremendous as well. As I already pointed out, 60% of our economy is driven by agriculture in this district. Part of what I hope to learn today is what Congress can do to further this important work. My staff and I reviewed the 46 recommended action items for the panel's initial report, and many of these are areas you need action from Congress on, exactly as Senator Daschle just commented, to involve either funding or oversight. As I looked through those, I was especially excited to say there'll be a point person, and that you had recommended the vice president would be that point person. If we ever do have such a catastrophic event, I would imagine the president will be very busy directing forces. It will be excellent that there is one person to help bring all these forces together. I don't sit on any of the funding committees that are centric to, our operation, uh, to appropriations committees, but I do have seats on two very important oversight committees that you're interested in, agriculture as well as science and technology. You have noticed that Congress has a full plate this year. The president seems to have a very demanding schedule ahead of us. We're focused on health care and tax reform at the current time. We certainly have a full legislative calendar this spring, but in the midst of these discussions, we're already starting to talk about the rest of the fiscal year for 2017 as our CR runs out on April 28th, and we're already working on budgets and appropriations, of course, for fiscal year 2018. My overarching hope of this year's appropriations process is that we can get back to providing certainty, long-term solutions for these projects that are dependent on federal appropriations and get our work done as Congress. Researchers are particularly concerned about stopgap funding measurements and government shutdowns. As you noted, we spend $6 billion annually on biodefense. I look forward to being an advocate, a voice for these funds, and welcome a discussion about improvements needed. As I traveled across this district over the past two years, I heard over and over a theme of people's biggest concerns. Number one was the economy. Their second biggest concern in Kansas was national security, which just shocked me. I was Rotary District Governor three years ago when I would have these same conversations. No one mentioned national security, but suddenly, two years ago, people in Kansas who are insulated by the coast were suddenly concerned about national security. It was typically the mother of three, the grandmother of nine. I call it women's intuition. But when, when my housewives in Kansas, the farmers' wives, are concerned about their own national security, something's going on. And we need to pay attention to those feelings and those concerns and start addressing them. I look forward to meeting with you today, learning more, and uh, would welcome your questions. So thank you for your eloquent statement and the passion that you've so articulated uh, on this issue. Uh, you're a physician, and you represent an agricultural district uh, uh, of remarkable uh, uh, stature with regard to its commitment to production and uh, research. Um, Seventy percent of the diseases are zoonotic. We talk a lot about One Health these days and the importance of what we call species-neutral approaches to, to addressing the challenges we face. You're in a very unique position as a physician and somebody with, with extensive agricultural economic experience in this, in this uh, uh, realm. Could you talk a little bit about the importance of One Health and what we can do to further bring together the sectors involving uh, these challenges in agriculture and in health together. 
Yeah. Thank you, Senator. If I would criticize politicians is that they often think in silos. They tend to think that immigration is just a security issue and not an economic issue. Uh, but there's, and, and this is the same situation. Um, when Ebola threatened us, um, my goodness, we were in a panic. And we were, I'm not sure how many people died from Ebola in this country, 20 or 30 or 40, which was horrible, but it could have been catastrophic. I've worked with Rotary for decades on eliminated polio, and a lot of the same systems that we developed from polio vaccination, we were able to use to help slow down Ebola, a lot of those same laboratories as well. An example of collaboration. And what I'm excited as I come back to my home uh, school today is talk about is to hear all the collaboration going on with Fusion in Topeka and the, the, the facility that's already here in Senator Roberts' building. And I uh, certainly expect that cooperation to go on. And certainly zoonotic uh, illnesses are going to require physicians and veterinarians and research people to work together. And I see that's my role is to keep pushing people to, uh, to bring this together. Don't repeat your your research that's already been done. Let's share the knowledge. Let's open up doors. Uh, enormous opportunities. Uh, Congressman Adrian Smith invited me up to Nebraska two or three months ago to their meat research center. What a wonderful facility they have. And I see incredible opportunity for NBAP to work with those people. Want to keep furthering this, uh, the collaboration going on here. Well, I, I couldn't be more pleased with your emphasis on collaboration. As you know, the Agriculture Committee, the House Agriculture Committee, and the Homeland Security uh, uh, Committee is going to be holding a joint hearing a little bit later this year. And we're very pleased with the collaboration that that represents. I've always felt that the four critical criteria are resilience, innovation, collaboration, and engagement. And uh, you certainly reflect that as you bring the experiences you've had here in Manhattan to, to that committee. Could you talk a little bit more about your expectations for collaboration between Homeland Security and, say, the Department of Agriculture? I, I think it's uh, we want to keep reaching out to other. As a new freshman Congress, I'm trying to find my way around. But it's exciting that several people from Homeland Security have already reached out to us. And they have significant roles here in Kansas and at this university that I was not even aware of. So I'm excited that someone's actually reaching out to us to develop relationships so I can take that relationship back to the House Ag Committee as we do start suggesting appropriations. Very good. Ken? Just uh, appreciate your comments, appreciate your, your passion for this issue, and um, your appreciation for the need for coordination and collaboration across the board. Um, you know, obviously, we have a set of recommendations that have been well received, and I think, um, you know, the, the government, both the, the last administration and the incoming administration, have recognized the seriousness of the issue and recognized the sincerity of our interest in trying to pursue these recommendations. Uh, do you have any thoughts about sort of um, now that you're you know, you're up on the hill? That's one of the main areas of focus for us. If you have any sort of broader sort of strategic thoughts about how we can mobilize um, some energy and focus on this issue up on the Hill among your colleagues up there. Great. I think that, uh, Man or that Manhattan is no different than Washington, D.C. It's all about relationships. And we are working very hard on those relationships, not just congressman to congressman, uh, but also legislative director to le legislative director, chief to chief. And that's why I wanted Dalton to come. Uh, he's, he's as familiar with NBAP as anybody is in the city of Washington, I would say. Uh, he has lived this as well, and, and, and thank, he, he knows the, the people. I think that Vice President Pence uh, is, a, is, is a great person for us to, to work with. He's a godly man, uh, certainly has a great relationship with Congress, and my strategy would be to try to get Vice President Pence to sign off on this, and if we get him to sign off on it, I think we're going down the way. And from Senator Daschle's earliest remarks, I'm going to reach down the aisle and across the aisle. This is not a political issue today. This is absolutely a national security issue. It's an economic issue. Um, I, I would just brag about my freshman class, if I could just for a second. 52 members, 10 of us have military experience. We have two generals, a Navy SEAL, a retired police chief, a retired sheriff's officer, a, a CIA agent. At least I think he was a CIA agent. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Um, an FBI agent, 
there's not a professional politician in my freshman class on my side of the aisle. I think that we're used to collaborating. I think that we, we're totally focused on getting this economy turned around. And until we get the economy turned around, there's not going to be much more money to, to fight over. So step one, get the economy turned around, work on national security, talk about health care for a while as well. So I, I think there's the opportunity there. Uh, we just had a huge bipartisan uh, event two weeks ago with the other freshman class, working with Speaker Gingrich on another uh, bipartisan opportunity as well. So it's about relationships. And Vice President Pence. Asha and Senator Dashiell, can reach out any to Any comments from either of you? Sure. Sure. Sir, thank you for, for, for coming today. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure what Speaker Ryan thought when you said, hey, I'm leaving Washington in the middle of your retreat to come out here, but this is important. And, yeah. and we appreciate sort of the, um, the implied message back to the Speaker that this is an important issue. Um, we know of your background as an MD, and uh, we know that you were uh, concerned about uh, Zika and, and other diseases. Still am concerned about still Zika. Am my, concerned. my own daughter can't go on a family vacation with us to Florida now to visit uh, my in-laws. So it's still, it's still out it's there. still an issue, yes. Yeah. We, haven't, you know, we haven't eradicated it from the United States or the world. Um, but could you talk a little bit more about your perspective, drawing on your perspective as an MD and, of course, as a congressman, um, and just give us your opinion on how you perceived things went in the United States with managing that and how you would recommend, you don't have to slam everybody, sir, but um, how you would recommend uh, we, we take that information, that experience, and change how we do things in the future. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm stating the obvious, but we were reactive rather than proactive. And, so, and a very disjointed, disorganized response to it. Uh, so we need standard, I would call it standards of care, centers of excellence. This is the way to do it. This, this Zinc is not the last virus that this is going to happen. Even HIV started off as a zoonic uh, harbinger. So I, I think we need more consistency saying this is the way, way we handle it. Uh, it's, it's tough. If a person walked into my hospital, in, I'm gonna, or here in Manhattan, with, with one of these contagious diseases, it would, be, it would not be simple for us to deal with it. Uh, we need to take it up three or four more notches. Mm -hmm. And the world we live in is so much smaller today, people traveling so much more. I'm genuinely concerned. I don't want to sit here 10 years from now and being on the panel where they say, Roger Marshall, why didn't you do something to prevent this? Did you do everything you could to prevent this catastrophic uh, disease that wiped out three-fourths of the cattle herd in, in the country? So we need to be more proactive. Mm -hmm. Ella? No, thank you. Well, Congressman Marshall, once again, thank you. We wish you well, and we thank you for your commitment and look forward to working with you in the months ahead. It's my pleasure. Ema. <laughs> <laughs> We will now invite our first panel to come uh, to the dais. Dr. Stephen Higgs is the Associate Vice President for Research and Director of Biosecurity, the Biosecurity Research Institute. Amy Kircher is the Director of Food Protection and Defense Institute at the University of Minnesota. And Steve Parker uh, is the head of the North American Veterinary Public Health Area. We welcome each of our panelists. I'm informed that uh, Steve Parker has to leave uh, early, so uh, uh, we will ask him to make his comments so that we can accommodate his schedule. Steve, please proceed. Thank you, Senator, and thank you to the panel for the invitation. Uh, yes, I, I will apologize ahead of time. I think uh, General Myers may understand why I'm uh, leaving early. I have twin grandsons that are graduating from boot camp at Paris Island tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. I've got to be there. <laughs> Yes, my name is Steve Parker. I'm uh, the head of North America Veterinary Public Health for Mariel, which is now part of Beringo Ingelheim Animal Health. 
Uh, my remarks today will reflect similar remarks that I made in February last year before a Congressional Ag Committee just on the state of vaccine capability when it comes to foot and mouth disease vaccine. As head of our North America veterinary public health business, I am responsible for our interface with the government on reportable mammalian uh, animal disease management programs. I work with USDA Veterinary Service, USDA Wildlife Services, state and local uh, governments on animal uh, disease management programs. We strive to align the capabilities of our company with the mission of the governments to advance solutions against a variety of reportable animal diseases. Foot and mouth disease is the most contagious and economically destructive global disease of livestock. An FMD event in the United States will have severe, profound, and long-lasting negative impact on the U U.S. agriculture and general economy. The USDA estimates that economic losses due to an <coughs> FMD event in the United States will range from $15 billion to $100 billion per year. Recent experiences in the United States with foreign animal disease outbreaks, such as porcine uh, epidemic diarrhea, uh, endemic diarrhea virus, and highly pathogenic avian influenza underscore the need for preparedness in dealing with high consequence animal diseases impacting agriculture. The current North America FMD vaccine bank stockpile is undersized to respond to anything other than a limited scope FMD outbreak. If FMD vaccines are to be considered as a countermeasure to after an FMD of, uh, outbreak, the reality is there is no global vaccine production industrial capability in existence today that could supply the FMD vaccine doses needed in the event of a North America outbreak. And there is no new FMD technology on the immediate horizon that has been developed, validated, tested, industrialized, put through the cost-benefit analysis, and available in a time frame that will rescue the U.S. from this dilemma. In layman's terms, and I am a layman, there is no golden spigot from which FMD vaccine doses will immediately flow. There is no pirate's hoard of FMD vaccine inventory on manufacturer's shelves. And there is no silver bullet in FMD research available any time soon to provide us relief. Thoughtful consideration should be given to advancing funding solutions that support building adequate FMD uh, vaccine bank stockpiles that are aligned with U.S. FMD vaccine use policy. Even though the current global FMD vaccine demand grossly exceeds the ability of conventional vaccine manufacturers to supply, an optimized vaccine need for the United States can be addressed with advanced planning and investment in building industrial capacity now. Expertise in FMD vaccinology is central to our company's history. For over 60 years, we've provided millions of doses of high quality, highly potent FMD vaccines. These high potent, high quality DIVA vaccines are produced for government clients around the world for endemic disease control situations, and also to assist governments in preparedness programs. In FMD-free countries, vaccine antigen banks are the standard model for emergency response to FMD outbreaks. Efficient antigen bank models match the quantity uh, of uh, bank antigen doses to the disease spread potential in target livestock populations, and that's combined with the manufacturer's response, rapid response, to convert those antigens to vaccine. It's a misnomer that we have a vaccine bank. We have an antigen bank, which is held uh, to be converted to the um, uh, vaccine. So the North America Bank stores frozen antigen concentrate for the production of emergency vaccine. This is mainly for the reason of shelf life preservation. The frozen antigen concentrate has a five-year shelf life. Finished vaccine only has 18, years, uh, 18 months of shelf life. FMD antigen banks are the reference solution that allow FMD-free countries to 
excess rapidly and in outbreak situations large quantities of purified highly potent vaccines. Within four days of activation of the North America Bank, our company can produce up to 2.5 million doses of finished vaccine from each of the vaccine antigen concentrate strains and make that vaccine available for shipment to the USDA for field distribution. The largest inventory in the bank are antigens from our company. We have the broadest, largest range of vaccine strains globally. These strains are used to produce single strain or multiple strain vaccines. This capability provides an insurance of protection against the vast majority of the strains circulating globally. As new FMD strains evolve, we continue to develop and propose new strains for inclusion in antigen banks. For non-endemic countries like the United States, the process of constantly updating the FMD library of strains is critical due to the unpredictability of a strain event in the U.S. Marielle operates FMD production in vaccine finishing facilities in the U.K., the Netherlands, France, and Brazil. As the world leader in FMD bank management, we maintain vaccine antigen storage facilities in multiple locations for our global clients as risk mitigation service. Our bank management services provide the cost effective advantages of timely new strain uh, inclusion, perpetual inventory rotation, and just in time antigen to vaccine conversion, along with risk mitigation in multiple shipping events. Vaccine banks are only a part of a well-developed FMD preparedness plan. Because FMD antigen banks only serve as a temporary measure in the face of an outbreak, optimized FMD preparedness plan should account for a seamless transition to surge production of the millions of doses of finished vaccine once the bank inventory is exhausted. The continuous supply of vaccine is critical to achieve control and elimination of the disease in order to return a country to disease-free trade status and steps to recover export markets. As requested by the Blue Ribbon Committee, we were asked to look at the challenges and opportunities. My comments in that area are as follows. The challenge, Presidential Directive number, number 9, calls for deployment of a sufficient amount of animal vaccines to appropriately <coughs> respond to the most damaging animal diseases affecting the economy within 24 hours of the outbreak. Today, the reality is it would be years before the industrial capacity exists to address anything other than a local focal point outbreak of FMD in the United States. Opportunity. The USDA APHIS FMD Veterinary Source sought, Sources Salt Notice of March 2016 collected market research information on the ability of mac vaccine manufacturers to make, store, and deliver FMD vaccines. This information collected allows the USDA to evaluate uh, the strategies of increasing the dose holdings in the bank of vaccine antigen contract traits against all the high priority FMD strains. It also provides information to USDA on the ability of the manufacturers to produce finished vaccine for an intermittent time period after vac uh, stockpiles are exhausted. This information is being used by USDA Veterinary Service to strengthen the options under their existing FMD preparedness and response plan. The opportunity for us and for the USDA is to develop budgets that support multiple foreign animal disease PREP options to outbreaks. Considering these options, federal executive budget planning and political action should focus on the short-term needs of fiscal years FY18 and FY19, along with dialogue around the animal health components for medium-term needs and development of the budget for the next farm bill. Uh, years, 2020 through 2024. The program funding and the 2020 Farm Bill should be linked to long-term uh, needs in subsequent Farm Bills for evergreen approaches to the economic viability of the U.S. livestock industry. 
Thank you to the panel, and I'm available for questions at the appropriate time. Mr. Parker, thank you. As I understand it, uh, your schedule does accommodate our taking the statements from the other two panel members before we open up to questions. Yes. That was going to be our plan. All right. Well, Dr. Higgs, we're delighted. We again thank you for the extraordinary day yesterday. <coughs> you were a big part of uh, its success, and we appreciate very much the information shared with us yesterday, and we're delighted to take your statement now. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here, Senator. Um, so, prevention and deterrence. I immediately, of course, looked up definitions of the terms and saw that <laughs> prevention is to stop something from happening or to stop somebody from doing something. Um, as an educator and parents, that is obviously not as easy, easily accomplished as it, it is said. Um, in terms of preventing an attack, that's going to be knowledge-based. Um, we need to know everything possible about the, the pathogens and about the potential perpetrators. It's sort of know the agent and know the agencies that are involved. Um, the type of research that you, you heard about at the Biosecurity Research Institute is critical to, to gain that sort of knowledge. And the information sharing capacity that we have and gathering with the Fusion Center and others and sharing that with people that can uh, respond to that and put it into action is very important. <clears throat> um, I, in terms of awareness of natural events, um, I'm not sure I'm typical, but I start my day every day at about 5.30 a.m. relaxing with a cup of coffee, looking at um, the internet, seeing where um, things are emerging and where outbreaks are occurring. And that information is also available to those that may act against us. That's um, very, very worrying. Um, working with these types of agents is a great responsibility that we take very seriously. Um, you know the select agent regulations are, are very strict, um, very laudable, and we take that very seriously in terms of security and safety with, with those agents. But if you make an analogy of, of a bioterrorist to, say, a car thief, if you uh, would like to make that analogy, car thieves do not go to well-lit, well-fenced um, car dealerships with, with security cameras. These types of pathogens are available in many places. A few years ago, I'll tell a true story. You know, I had a friend who thought it would be fun to take undergraduate students to a prairie dog field with a battery operated vacuum cleaner and suck the fleas out. And as part of that thought, well, we'll may as well make a purpose to this and, and look for Yersinia pestis. And as soon as they discovered that about 30% of the samples were positive, they realized that might not be such a good exercise in, in the classroom <laughs> at biosafety level two. Um, so these things really are available. Um, as I said yesterday, we, we have a, a good list of the pathogens prioritized, and there is good news that over the last decade or more, we have developed technologies that can very quickly identify those. Um, it sounds simple. If we knew where and when, I have total confidence that we could identify the pathogens. Um, and I know there's movement on this. this. This announcement came out yesterday, no, Monday, from Homeland Security. And um, I applaud them on this, that they are looking to develop a, a comprehensive bio-event detection capability. It came out on Monday. The applications are due in two weeks' time, and there's $2 million to do this. Um, I'm a little cynical, sorry. Um, <laughs> The other problem is that you look at a map of the United States and your eyes focus on the cities and the towns. Um, agriculture is everywhere. Agriculture is in all of that vast area of, of gaps between. And the ability to detect a pathogen in those areas is going to be extremely difficult. Extremely difficult, if not impossible. I said with confidence that if we... Um, can detect a pathogen, we can identify it. But my mind goes back to 1999 with, with West Nile, a zoonotic pathogen um, discovered in 1937, uh, first outbreak in Israel in the 50s. Over that 50 years, through field studies, through laboratory studies, we knew a tremendous amount about that pathogen. We knew the biology, we knew the transmission cycles, the pathogenicity, the genetics. 
And yet, when it occurred in 1999 in a major metropolis in, in the United States, in New York, we found ourselves unprepared. Um, since then, in five years, it spread throughout the United States in every, in every state. It's killed about 25,000 horses. It's infected an estimated 2.5 million people. Um, about 2,000 people have died. We're now seeing evidence that even those who don't become very sick may have quality of life and even duration of life curtailed. Um, we still don't have a vaccine 17 years later. Um, what did we learn? What should we have learned from this? Well, um, we were unprepared. Experts can be wrong. It was originally misdiagnosed by experts who said it's, it's not going to survive the winter. Um, you know, we have to not assume that the obvious is right. Uh, it was a very astute veterinarian who spotted that the pattern of of disease in birds in New York did not fit the pattern associated with St. Louis encephalitis virus. Um, and then we also learned we did not have enough facilities and we did not have enough people trained. The CDC did a marvelous job at creating um, and funding new training programs and then they just were dissipated after West Nile is still here. It's still causing a lot of infections. It's not going away. But people are complacent about it. Um, the Honourable Mar Dr. Marshall mentioned Zika virus. Um, you know, Zika emerged in 2008. It came to the Americas in 2015. It's caused uh, over 4,500 cases in the United States, travel related, 200 and some cases transmitted by mosquitoes here, 35,000 cases in Puerto Rico already. Uh, you, you know, the big question is, how many times can we be caught unprepared? And uh, I wish I had an answer to that, by the way. Um, and let's not forget plants. We've got researchers, Jim Stack is here, working on wheat blast, um, a foreign pathogen that causes 100% uh, crop losses, potentially. Introduced into Pakistan last year, first time outside of Bolivia and Brazil, and has reduced their, their national productivity of wheat by 30% last year, and has just been identified again, it's still here, or still there, unfortunately. Um, correct me if I, I get this wrong, Dr. Stack, but um, last year there was a bacterial leaf uh, streak of corn, uh, Xanthomonas vesicula, uh, discovered in the United States, an African pathogen, already in four states, and when you read some of the um, internet releases, you know, I, I saw this statement, confirmation was delayed because of lack of historical research on the pathogen and limited data. Um, that is a, a recurring theme, unfortunately. And food, we've got food research, Randy Phoebus is here, looking at sugar toxin E. coli that causes 265,000 cases a year with um, 4,000 hospitalization and maybe a, um, quite a number of deaths. Um, these are all issues that we cannot ignore, but which we know about. Um, and deterrence, use of punishment as a threat to deter people from offending. Again, not easy. Um, you know, in a broader sense, this also depends on communication and, and knowledge. Um, I think that people knowing that you have the capacity to stop these events is in itself a deterrent. Um, but for the nothing ventured, nothing gain type of perpetrators, this is not a su sufficient deterrent. We need to be able to respond and, dare I say, retaliate with effective sanctions if this happens, and they need to know that. Um, good news, you have said a number of times um, we, we should move from rhetoric to action, sir. Um, this is a bipartisan issue. You're a champion for us. Um, you're well respected and people listen to you and K-State, I know, is here to help move this forward. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Higgs, for your eloquent statement and uh, your commitment that you've made your professional life to this issue. We appreciate it very much. We'll have some questions in just a moment, but in, uh, we are now delighted to have uh, Dr. Kirshner, uh, the Director of Food Protection and Defense Institute of the University of Minnesota, who's traveled a good distance to be here. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you for the opportunity. As a 
former DOD epidemiologist working on Homeland Security and a dairy, uh, daughter of a dairy farmer, I thank you for considering this critical issue that's often forgot. I also thank Dr. My or General Myers for allowing maroon and gold to enter the purple <laughs> campus. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, per the Homeland Security Presidential Directive Number 9, the Food Protection Defense Institute is one of the university-based centers of excellence in agriculture and food defense. And I would argue to say our mission is to protect your dinner. And actually, we work to protect all the foods you consume, especially those post-harvest. Over the past decade, I would say there's been significant efforts to look at our food production animals. But let us not forget the plethora of food and nutrients that you consume each day that are not produced by animals. These foods have threatened our public's health, and they serve as delivery mechanisms for weapons of mass destruction. This Christmas, Greece faced a daunting event where terrorists threatened to adulterate Coca-Cola, Unilever, and Nestle products with chlorine and hydrochloric acid while leaving the packaging intact. It took New Zealand over 10 months to identify the perpetrator that added a pesticide to infant formula and sent samples to the government and industry, threatening a larger commercial release. Our complex, open, interconnected food and agriculture critical infrastructure cannot be ignored. So for those that joined us for dinner last night, I took a moment to assess our meal. And I can assure you that you ate a global plate of ingredients oil that made up the dressing on your salad for those that chose to eat it, came likely from Turkey, Syria, Italy, Spain, and perhaps Portugal. This is a commodity that has repeatedly seen adulteration, with estimates as high as 73% of olive oil being counterfeit. In the most catastrophic case, industrial oil was substituted for food grade oil. This resulted in the deaths of 600 Spaniards. It is estimated that 10% of the food in your grocery store has been adulterated, resulting in a 10 to $15 billion loss to industry each year. So I challenge you, next time you go to the market, look in your cart and know that potentially 10% of that is adulterated. Conservatively, the ingredients that made up the dinner last night, by my calculations this morning, were 103. That is 103 supply chains that we must continually protect and secure to ensure that we're feeding our citizens safe food. Today I've been asked uh, with my colleagues to present three issues related to prevention and deterrence. So let me start with the first. We must be able to understand supply chain security from the farm to retail marketplace. This is a growing problem from several perspectives. First, the increase in globalization of sourcing within our supply chains and our cross-infrastructure dependence are creating real operational and food integrity challenges that our government and most food companies are not prepared to address. The risk to the supply chain presents serious human health and economic risk for our industry and our American consuming public. Let me acknowledge this includes transportation within our food supply chains, which is an enormous source of risk to our food supply. We've seen this manifest in the rise of cargo, food cargo theft, product diversion, and <coughs> adulteration of products ranging from baby formula to cereals. This creates huge brand risk and increased insurance costs for producing firm, but it also directly impacts consumer prices through increases, substandard consumer products, and the increased cost of all forms of public assistance programs, such as SNAP. Varying parts of our government and the industry own the responsibility to prevent and deter adulteration in our supply chain, yet we do not collectively talk. FDA and USDA may own regulation of food while DHS has consequence management. The FBI has the authority to understand and investigate criminal activity, yet state health departments may individually be assessing illegal importation of puffer fish or unpasteurized camel milk without even contacting law enforcement. Secondly, the growth of technology has created vast security problems for our food supply chain, packing houses to the retail stores. Worse, the systems within our food production and supply sector are largely unmonitored and lack active security defenses. For example, the growth in cyber attacks in the food and beverage sector is astonishing. 
For the past two years, retail food and beverage and hospitality has been the most targeted sector for a cyber attack. Yet the food sector is the least protected or postured for, food, for cyber defense. FDA has taken the position that cyber defense within the sector is not in their purview of responsibility. In fact, no agency has taken on the task of hardening the food sector. The food processing world is now utterly dependent upon industrial controls that are comprised of vast, largely unprotected, yet completely connected networks of all types of computer system control devices. Now, these devices range from valves, pumps, flows, temperature controls for refrigeration and cooking. They include quality control systems to cleaning and inventory management. Even the small devices on our processing lines are directly linked back to their manufacturers for maintenance and updates. Most of these systems are connected to other networks and that, that are connected to the in internet and routinely open, unprotected, or minimally protected. <laughs> Few have even the most basic intrusion detection capability. Recent reports from cyber protection organizations such as Trustwave and CrowdStrike highlight these common shortcomings in basic cyber defense within our food system. Hack cyber systems within the food industry have already led to the malicious pickup of cargo from a warehouse or direct theft on the highways of entire shipments of food via hijacking or other forms of strong arm theft. These criminals are now deploying devices to counter our GPS units in our cabs and similarly in the cargo trailers. This is a very lucrative business and a growing area of crime, resulting in food being the most stolen cargo in 2014 and 2015 in the US. In most cases, the stolen food is very profitable and is reintroduced into commerce within the United States via unscrupulous wholesale distributors. In other cases, food shipment is illegally exported to another country for sale. In either case, the safety and nutritional value of these stolen products is questionable as the cold chain or handling may not be appropriate. In a worst case scenario, a cyber attack could result in the production and distribution into commerce of a dangerously adulterated food product. <coughs> Lastly, let me highlight the sustainment of expertise, research and development, and operational support for the food and ag sector. Our center, along with the Center of Excellence here at K-State for Emerging and Zoonotic Animal Diseases, was created to provide a capability to the government and industry for protection. Specifically, my center, the Food Production and Defense Institute, addresses broad sector risk issues and develops novel food protection solutions that are unique and addressed nowhere else in the country. The investment in our Food Protection Institute has been significant since 2004 and has directly benefited the government and industry. The benefits to the consuming public are direct and cost effective. This has been demonstrated numerous ways, from identification of melamine adulteration in pet food, animal feed, candy, to various <coughs> ingredient adulterations and contamination events. The consortiums created by these centers include subject matter experts that have accomplished national level critical assessments, biosurveillance capabilities, and operational support for the industry, federal, and state food agency communities. Being able to assess the risk and design mitigation strategies rapidly for events like the Ebola, uh, Ebola event, where we were asked to look at bush meat and West African food commodities that were of significant concern is a capability that does not exist elsewhere. Knowing the dynamic threat of our food supply allows us to implement deterrence mechanisms such as detection technology at the border to identify harmful pathogens in our ports before Americans consume the product. In this vein, let me give you a current example that I face. So I have to say this, we as Minnesotans and hockey players embrace the great one, Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> <laughs> one of his famous quotes is, I skate to where the puck is going, not to where it's been. In that vein, we created a, what we're calling a bioawareness capability, which goes beyond surveillance. We're trying to find where the puck is going. We fuse and organize big data such as political instability, weather anomalies, production reporting, crowdsourcing, and historical events to identify issues 
and predict where we'll have food system disruption. With this data, we can put deterrence mechanisms in place, whether it be an import alert or a spe specific testing strategy. This tool allows all those working to protect our food system to be part of the deterrent structure, yet I have no place to give this technology to, offer a service for, for those that take action. It's simply sitting at the University of Minnesota. In summary, I've been asked to offer some policy recommendations in regards to prevention and deterrence, so I have three. I believe they align with the panel's recommendations and in some cases may highlight. First, a priority must be placed for broadening the interagency engagement at the national and state level on protection of our food systems against foreign manipulation, theft, and intentional adulteration. Additionally, public-private engagement within the food and ag sector must be broadened and strengthened. I would recommend the creation of a central food entity to address food and agriculture defense strategies and operations. This entity must engage the private sector. The current separation of efforts has resulted in no no committed work to advance our ability to prepare for or respond to significant food disruption. There is a significant lack of clarity on all fronts, especially with regards to the authority to prepare for and implement food defense activities that will prevent and defer, uh, deter adulteration of our nation's food supply. Secondly, we must have responsible agencies at the federal level direct to collaborate actively and very quickly on hardening our cyber systems employed within our food supply. This must be done in conjunction with the food industry. And third, we have to develop a funding mechanism to continue research and, def and development of food defense efforts and provide technical reach back to federal, state, local agencies, and the food industry. This mechanism must include a prioritization schema for funding those activities that fill gaps in our nation's biodefense related to food and ag. It should not be a mechanism to fund pet projects at university levels. Efforts should be focused on significant challenges, such as vulnerability assessments of the entire food supply, to include all the interdependencies to our critical infrastructure, and plan for things like black swan events, where what if we had to determine how to domestically produce food to feed our population if our imports are significantly limited? Our food defense challenges, I would argue, are not insurmountable. However, we have to commit to action now to see improvement soon. Thank you. Well, Dr. Kirscher, thank you for a very sobering statement. I, uh, I'm going to look at my lunch a lot differently today. <laughs> I'll tell you what to eat. Please do. <laughs> and if I could just have you accompany me from here on out. That would be great. As we talk about prevention and deterrence, you emphasize the importance of the need for collaboration and a public-private partnership. And as we talk about going from words to action, I can't think of anything more important than how we design that collaboration. And it presents the question once again that I've referred to a couple of times, who's in charge? How do you, how do you from your experience and from, from what you've already learned, how would you answer that question? Who should be in charge of this effort to make sure that this collaboration takes place, this public-private partnership actually is created? Could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, I'm likely a little Pollyanna-ish uh, being in the government for 20 years, but I would argue that we have to bring together the agencies involved in food and, and make one entity that combines with the industry. The industry is ready to participate. But if we reside and leave siloed agencies with partial responsibilities, we will not advance. There has to be a collective effort to fund both the manpower and the resources needed to look at food and ag defense. We will not do it siloed. Well, I couldn't agree more. Dr. Higgs, you, you spoke so powerfully about pathogen detection. If you had to rank order the barriers to pathogen detection today, if you had to list what, what is it we have to overcome to get there, how would you rank order the challenges or the barriers that exist, and how might we look at overcoming them? I, I wish I had 
clear, defined answers to that. Um, I mean, obviously, I think we have the technology. It's not always cheap technology. Um, it's placement of that technology. Um, and in terms of agriculture, as I, as I spoke, it, it, it's the area is vast. We can't be looking at everywhere. If we're looking for a human type attack, you know, you're going to look in urban areas. Um, an agricultural attack could happen at almost any feedlot, any any farm in the United States and in some remote areas probably wouldn't be detected and, until it had taken hold and got out of control. So we need to engage agencies just like you said um, and, and coordinate the effort. And of course, there is the funding issue which, which your panel um, revealed. This is not cheap. It's very, in fact, it's very expensive. The tests are expensive to develop. They're even more expensive to deploy. And you need an authority that is working with all partners, all involved government agencies. The, the end goal should be the same for all of us to, to stop these things. But um, there are different agendas for different agencies. Um, but we need them to work together. We need to get rid of... Um, egos and uh, sort of possessiveness of of authority and share that and share it in a logical way mm. so that we can work together. <coughs> I think that's the key barrier. So if I could ask you the same question I just asked Dr. Kirshner, if there's one thing that we could do right now, action-wise, to improve pathogen detection, is there a one thing that comes to mind? There's so many pathogens out there that threat. Um, as you know, the one statement I said, you know, if we knew when and where, right. we could identify how. We can't. We can't do that. Intelligence and information sharing is critical in this. And I think that the one thing that immediately springs to mind is that um, sharing of information to to predict. Getting ahead of the game, I can't make a sports analogy, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, it's true. If we have that predictive capability and the, the ability to take action, then, then we can help to stop this. Mr. Parker, you make such a compelling case for improving our capacity for manufacturing vaccines and our inability at this point to come anywhere close to what is necessary to get the job done. You mentioned the Department of Agriculture and the slow response time that we've seen there. If you had to put an action plan together, say for the next two years, as we look at manufacturing and our overall need to incent the private sector in particular to address the problem more effectively, what would it look like? Uh, well, I, first off, I would uh, go back to USDA Veterinary Services. I, they they have information now, and they they have, in my opinion, been very proactive in seeking out uh, input and have collected information. And it's my belief that they are acting on that information. So, um, the that should, in my opinion, lead to a series of recommendations or actions that would result in uh, a budget uh, request. Um, agriculture, in my opinion in general, is not always first in mind when it comes to budget priorities on the federal level. I'm an unabashed Aggie. I'm University of Georgia, animal scientist, and you know, just it just goes to the core of my being of what it is to be in this industry. The nobleness of being able to provide food and fiber safely to uh, our population. So it, in, in, in a leadership way, we need agricultural advocates in Washington to speak for the unique position that the United States is in is that we still lead in agriculture. This is something we do well. And how do we want to protect it and improve it? 
and to make that case not only to the President and to Congress, but to the American people. It is a strategic advantage that we own, and it's at risk. And therefore, there are some steps that we can take. Uh, Health and Human Services worked years ago on human influenza with private industry to <coughs> increase production capacity for influenza vaccines. Why not should the same thing exist for animal agriculture? I mean, we, we bring tools to the table, but they can only be put in place if there's a path and there's funding. One thing I say, Senator, I'm, I'm a layman. I'm a business manager. I do not apologize for making money. That's my job. I'm to return value to the shareholder, not just to my company, but to my clients and who I deal with. And the recognition of that dynamic, to me, would be very important in advancing now. I mean, we can't, we can't come back next year and talk about this. We're living on borrowed time. Thank you. Ken? Go ahead, make follow. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Go I just ahead. wanted to follow Please. up on, on that point. It, it seems that there's been an enormous effort put in through public-private partnerships into dealing with FMD, often considered the greatest threat to, to U.S. agriculture. Um, but there are a lot of other potential threats to agriculture that haven't had that investment of resources. And um, Dr. Marsh is here from Indiana, and he knows all too well what happens when there's an avian influenza outbreak. Basically, it's it's culling. That, that, that is what we do right now in, in 2017 to handle avian flu and, and other similar infectious diseases. Should, should we be in such a position in the 21st century where culling is our only option? How do we incentivize more public-private partnerships working with biotech and biopharma to create more medical countermeasures for the myriad threats um, that, that our, our livestock are at risk from. Dr. Carlin, if, just my experience in interacting with the commodity groups and livestock producers, they're not going to stand for culling. Now, local focal point outbreaks, maybe that is, you know, stop animal movement, local focal point control with culling, but um, the, we should have and I think the commodity groups are saying we want continuity of business. Yes, we're going to lose our international markets, but we've got to seek recovery of that. In the meantime, we need to support the basic structure of livestock production in the United States in the face of these events that are, that are catastrophic. Uh, and, and certainly my, my interpretation of where the USDA is with their current uh, vaccine policy and notions of, of control, culling will not be a major tool. It might be a supportive tool to go after the frank outbreak, but in the long term, no, it's continuity of business, and that does not include culling, in my opinion. Thank you. Ken. Okay, thank you. Um, my thanks to the panel for your illuminating comments um, in all these areas. Dr. Kirscher, I'd like to start with you. Um, just to, you, you talked about hardening the supply chain, the food supply chain. Uh, and I just want to put this in sort of stark dollar and cents terms. Um, so if we are talking about, let's say, plastic explosives and you want to maintain the security of plastic explosives, you know, it's a relatively limited source of plastic explosives. Uh, it's, a, in practical terms, those the supply chain of plastic explosives can probably be fairly closely monitored. Um, when you're talking about food, and you're talking about an intentional adulteration of food, it's just, you know, food supply is everywhere. Um, and it comes in it's pack different packaging and different forms, it's stored in different places. And the, the idea of, you, let's say you have a perpetrator who decides either for sort of traditional terrorism reasons to make a statement. Um, a political statement decides to, like any terrorist attack, adulterate some food. Or somebody who wants to 
uh, try to damage a particular macaroni and cheese company and adulterates a few boxes of macaroni and cheese to then cause a public panic and then cause a downturn in sales. It seems very difficult to harden the supply chain sufficiently to actually prevent that. Um, too many places where uh, boxes of macaroni and cheese will be left in a warehouse would be easy to get into um, or on a truck or at a store. So I guess my long way of asking this question is, when you talk about hardening, are you really talking about making sure that there are fences and locks and that kind of thing? Or is the money better spent in sort of regular testing, monitoring, so that while we can't lock up every box of macaroni and cheese in the country, we do have a process in place that makes sure that a sufficient percentage of the food is tested and monitored so that if there is something, it's caught quickly. In fact, that Dr. Gibbs, I think the same point as you. You talked. You made the very apt analogy to, you know, the car theft situation. That the car thief isn't going to go to a locked lot with, with lights and everything. However, their cattle and, in and pigs in hundreds of thousands of places around this country, they can't all be protected. So, um, how would you recommend? if you're the president or Congress or OMB and trying to look at this issue in the food supply context, how would you recommend them focusing on the sort of the hardening versus the monitoring and testing? Sure. So I think we've gotten really good at guns, gates, and guards. So Mm -hmm. I would, um, I don't know that I have a full check mark there, but that's what we focused on initially. And so now we need to look more at risk stratification. What is most at risk? So we need the intelligence community and we need historical evidence of what's been adulterated in the past and what is likely to be adulterated. And we can do that. We can look, we have risk strategies and assessment ways of looking at what food potentially could produce a viable disruption, right? So we're continually looking at where to predict that disruption and then understanding food processes. If something has what we would call a kill step where it kills a pathogen, then we're gonna worry less about that. So how do we start looking at what's coming into our ports, what already exists within our country, and that are high risk comparatively to everything else that we already have a mitigation strategy in place? Those risk assessments, looking at vulnerability, putting mitigation steps in place, all require effort for us collectively to look at it. Information that sets at FBI is not necessarily shared with other regulators. DHS has consequence management and it has ENVIS. ENVIS doesn't get all the data that exists that we know about where there are risks in the system. We know research has been done by terrorist organizations about what should they attempt to adulterate because we have no gun, no gate, no guard, and no methodology to kill a pathogen. We need to bring that together into a fusion capability of sorts that has representation from not only the government, but from industry and the academy. July 1, our centers don't answer the phone anymore because there's not continued funding. There has been a huge investment in these centers of excellence, and I'm not arguing that we continue to fund them the way they are, but I have 50 universities in my consortium that can answer calls to help if we've got an issue or help with risk stratification. So if I were to put some money together or talk to OMB or go to the president, I would say we have to create an entity that starts to look at risk both come inside and potentially coming in through our ports. That means intelligence, that means food safety, that means food engineers, epidemiologists, public health, and business continuity. Dr. Gibbs, you wanna address that? Well, I, that, that was a, a great example. Um, and we saw the same scenario with, with West Nile. The Center for Disease Control got a $50 million award, I think it was $50 million, um, to establish uh, centers of excellence for training in vector-borne diseases. But after three or four years, um, you know, I was the director of one of those centers. I think we had like 14 students that produced 60 or 70 publications in four years. Very productive. A lot of those people are still in the field but quite a few of them have left because they weren't sustained. And we finished those centers, you know, very sadly without continuation of funding. And 
without solving the, the problem of West Nile or new vector-borne diseases. And then, then we've seen chikungunya, we've seen Zika, and it's the same story again. Um, so it's a huge investment, but it's a very strategic and worthwhile investment in these in these centres. And, you know, we have one here at Case Stent. We have, uh, we have CSAT here. Um, getting all that expertise, getting the knowledge and the information sharing, and then dare I say, abandoning those, seems a tragedy. It does not seem like a forward-thinking um, strategy to, to help this country. Mr. Parker, if I may, do um, you want to sort of put this in, in simple terms that I can understand? Um, so you're, you made a very strong point about, you know, the need to have sufficient vaccines stockpiled to tide us over in the event of a uh, foot and mouth disease outbreak until you can then do a surge uh, production and, and address it more comprehensively. Um, so uh, can you give us a little more color on sort of how, let's, let's say we the status quo remained and we only had the limited stockpile we have now for a few of the expected strains. And there were an outbreak of one of those expected strains. And so we didn't have enough stockpiled to really address it in the first instance. How long would it take for that surge capacity to to come into play? And obviously, you know, this is I look at it, and I think many people, and lawmakers, and and policy folks look at this in the animal context very differently than the human context, right? Because you know, gosh, we don't have the stockpile for, to deal with anthrax, uh, and it takes X amount of time. That's X amount of human lives. Obviously, we want to protect animal lives, but it's a different sort of value judgment. So how long would it take, or can, can that even be quantified before we know what the outbreak is, before you could, let's say, have enough to protect the, the pig you know, population or you know, our livestock? Yes, there's, there are ways to get to that. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, you know, I work for a global company. Yes, I'm an American citizen, and I'm going to argue vigorously on behalf of the United States if that were to happen as the business manager to get my place in the industrial queue. But our capacity is already spoken for, for other countries. Now, one point on that, the reduction of FMD virus globally should only help the United States. Well, I would like to think that our company would shut off the other customer and say, yes, we're going to turn it all to the United States. That's not reality. But there is a recognition that North America needs are very important. That goes up to the highest levels within our company, not just my former. You see, I'm in a bit of a transition now. We used to be owned by the French, now we're owned by the Germans, so I've got to start <laughs> speaking German this year. And I'm making those kinds of arguments. Now, Senator Dasher, I started out with Merck 40 years ago. The company has changed around me, but I've only had one job interview my entire life, so I've had several companies that have owned me, and I've stayed with the same company. So I'm prepared to make those arguments, but again, you're dealing with a corporate entity that is global in responsibility, and we have commitments. However, there is recognition, and we're making progress to try to, to bring the appropriate level of commitment from the United States. If the, if the United States wants to go down this path, we're ready to act today. I have been asked by my senior management, what assurances can you get? And we'll build a new facility. I apologize. I've got to go. I've got to fly. <laughs> I'm I, I ready to apologize. You're excused totally, Mr. Parker. Thank, Thank you. you very much for making the effort to come. Asha, do you have further questions? I do. Um, Dr. Kircher, one of my close colleagues, uh, you mentioned the, the idea of creating a new entity, uh, taking the pieces and parts of various other federal and maybe other levels of government uh, and putting them together to create a new entity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As you know, historically, we don't, we don't 
tend to do a whole lot of that in the United States, um, with the exception recently of the Department of Homeland Security, not a small entity. Uh, but there's a model there, I suppose. Um, but another option that's often utilized by the United States government is to create some kind of coordination center. Uh, we've done it for export enforcement, for example, um, where the various federal agencies come together. And if there's a private sector aspect to it, they're pretty good about pulling them in. Not so sure about pulling in state and local, territorial and tribal, but we've seen the other. Uh, what would your what would your feeling be about that? If we couldn't if we couldn't create a new governmental entity uh, or governmental organization, um, do you think that that would be a, a valuable thing, or would it just be a whole bunch of people coming together and still operating in silos but sitting in one space in the Washington metropolitan area? I absolutely. Absolutely think that's a viable option. And I think what I would argue in that case is to give um, one agency some authority to help implement that coordination groups, either their recommendations or their information. Um, we've long argued for a new way to think about biosurveillance and be able to produce back to the agencies, whether they're uh, federal or state or, or local, um, an ability to share information, although we could never find the right mechanism. So I think a coordination center would be fine. I think it has to be resourced. We have to put a commitment and, um, and some requirements behind our agencies filling those positions. We have to have all represented with seats in, you know, butts in chairs. It can't be just a, uh, a formality. We have to have actual FDA, USDA, CDC, FBI representation in this coordination group. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is, we've been challenged many times to do interagency efforts. So again, making sure the resources, both from a manpower and uh, a financial model are there with the authority to implement this coordination groups, whether their recommendations or their efforts will be critical. Okay, thank you. And um, <clears throat> Dr. Higgs, one of the uh, things that has come up in discussion with uh, Senator Daschle and uh, Ken Weinstein, one of their questions uh, earlier this week as we were preparing was, um, how many BSL-4 labs do we have? And what is everybody doing? And, you know, we do seem to have a lot. In the United States, of course, you've seen some of the, the stories about the proliferation of BSL-4 laboratories, uh, different agencies, different departments, funding different things. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want you to give us a number of BSL-4 laboratories, but it, it, it led to another conversation about who's doing research on what in which laboratory and does everybody laboratory know, every laboratory know who who all is doing what there's a connection of course to the select agent program where theoretically the two departments that are in charge of the select agent program know where the select agents are and so therefore know what research is being done on those um, what is what is your sense of that? Is there enough knowledge flowing around as to who is doing what so there isn't too much overlap, um, putting aside notions of competition? And um, what would you say or what would you recommend in terms of making sure that gaps are filled and we don't have everybody, wor everybody working on, you know, three uh, diseases all at the same time, leaving everything else off on the side? Okay. A complex question. Um, so we have a number of BSL-4s run by different um, agencies and groups, NIH, uh, private universities, um, Center for Disease Control, and so forth. Um, they are well regulated. What we're missing, and this is the, the great importance of uh, NBAF, National Biogra Defense Facility, is we have no real capability to work on real livestock, large animals with BSL-4 agents, and um, that you know, we hear about MBAF as a replacement for Plum Island, but it's much more. Um, it is adding substantially a new capability to the US that we desperately need. Um, most of the projects in, in, in these laboratories are um, extramurally funded or funded, for example, by NIH. Mm -hmm. So there is oversight to um, try and avoid duplication. I would say some duplication is not a bad thing because there is by duplication is verification that your results and your data are um, independently valid. So that, you know, um, sure. you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, you want to, to spread that around. Um, I think there's good coordination, but there is um, a significant lack of, 
of, of capability. And of course, other countries have level fours as, as well with whom we have good relationships. There's um, uh, sort of an alliance of BSL-4 directors. Uh, I know uh, a number of those in different countries and they're our partners. So the capacity is limited but it is growing, thank you. Um, and on the international side, you, you mentioned just now the, uh, the this alliance. Does this uh, international alliance include, um, for example, our friends in Russia and other countries that have BSO-4 laboratories that we don't necessarily consider our, on our allied list? Um, I don't know whether we, we have much of a, a relationship with some of those Russian labs like uh, Novosibirsk and so, mm -hmm. so forth. We certainly have great relationships with the labs in, in Germany, in Australia, in Canada. Um, and up until the um, uh, approval of, of NBAF, I mean, the, our research, our BSL-4, until that's completed, our BSL-4 livestock research is done by those partners. Um, our research may not be their priority, and they're busy places. So uh, having our own facility is very important. Mm -hmm. okay. That's it for me, sir. Thank you, Asha. Ellen, do you have further questions? I just had one follow-up question for Dr. Kircher. I was really interested in the statistic that you said uh, it's estimated that 10% of food in the grocery store is adulterated, and that's certainly far higher than I, as, as a layperson, would, would have expected. And um, is, is the majority of that imported? And if so, is that because so much of our food is imported or because we have such good food regulations here in the United States? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we better protect that imported food supply because I think it's a really tough nut to crack. Sure. Um, so you're all welcome for that 10% comment. I know you'll all think about me when you go grocery shopping. Um, so that 10% is coming from those products that we've found. They're not as labeled. Now, that 10% could be a, a, a plethora of things. It could be um, the label is incorrect. We had um, one company who had um, misspelled um, one of their ingredients, and then we found counterfeit pro uh, product because the uh, perpetrators spelled it correctly on their label. Um, <clears throat> you know, wow. we found a gentleman in China who makes a synthetic egg completely, the yolk, the white, and the shell, and they sell them by the dozen. I mean, it's just pervasive in our system. I mean, if there's any food you all don't want to eat, let me know and I'll give you a story. Um, so I think what we really need to do again is go back to this um, risk stratification. Where have we historically seen things? What do we know can be easily adulterated? Where do we not have good quality testing? Because that's where we should look. I also know that when disaster happens anywhere in the world, for whatever reason, I can give you a scenario of how we should start thinking about food. So if we've got flooding in Thailand and we start seeing some disease coming in on shrimp, I already know where to start thinking about those import strategies and where in the U.S. we're going to see that and how to add additional manpower to six ports so that we can look shrimp differently. When we had the tsunami and uh, <coughs> Fukushima, this is big brain science that I didn't do, right? The bounce back of the wave took out scallops in Chile. Well, that's a two-year harvest cycle. It's not rocket science. We shouldn't see Chilean sea scallops for two years. So let's put an import alert on, and anyone seeing sea scallops will know they're probably lying. That's probably counterfeit. When Ebola happened, the first thing I thought of was cocoa. What's happening? Well, you know what? We went and looked in the index right away that we maintain, and people cut cocoa with corn husks <coughs> and arrowroot and dirt. So for three months, we should inspect cocoa at a higher rate because the likelihood that people are going to try to make money because we saw a surge in prices is greater. So there are all kinds of there are all kinds of signals and precursors and triggers to help us figure out this 10% and mitigate it. But again, we have to work cooperatively and we have to get to a place where these food protection and defense activities can collectively be owned and accomplished. Right now, they sit across our agencies. If I have to deal with cheese pizza, I talk to FDA. If that pizza has pepperoni, I talk to USDA. <clears throat> I mean, come on, right? We need to find a better way. And I would hate to say foods are, but hey, 
let's say foods are, we need some way to think defensively about our infrastructure. Thank you. Well, if, if I could just follow up on that. Um, <laughs> that 10% number caught my attention too and um so this just a definitional question so mm -hmm. in terms of adulteration mm -hmm. adulterated food that label or that definition mm -hmm. would include not only food that has something as a dangerous quality right. to it, but also but, economic right but also just something it could be like you said mm -hmm. seafood that is held holds itself out as being a particular type of seafood right. it's a different type but doesn't necessarily threaten one's health well, that so would that would be encompassed in that definition of adulteration and therefore within that 10 percent absolutely i'm just looking for some hope that right. <laughs> one out of ten of the things i see in the market aren't going to kill me a amy can you also uh, just sure. to jump on that real quick you know you have we're throwing around a number of terms adulteration yeah. uh counterfeit yeah. um you know and so forth can you sure cover yeah. those so when we say contamination we mean naturally occurring when I say adulteration, we say there's an intentional component. And in that intentional component, terrorism, sabotage, which includes disgruntled employees, and man, we have enough examples of that, and then economically motivated. So those that are trying to make money somehow throughout our food system. So the, the economic is quite large and concerning just from a brand damage uh, perspective. Um, and so regarding that 10%, and I'm so glad you brought up seafood. I mean, when we think about even economic adulteration, right, there are those things, you know, Dr. Oz loves to call and say, let's talk about lemon juice because that's his platform. Well, we dilute it with, people dilute it with water. It's not a public health consequence necessarily. But when we talk about seafood, yes, we have over icing of frozen fish to increase weight so it costs you more but we have an incredible amount of substitution of species that is unbelievably affecting our global population for people who have allergens or for foods that create GI syndromes. Um, just this past year, we had um, a, a poor crop of cumin. And so what did they do? They wanted to boost the color, so they added peanut protein. Think about if you know anyone with an allergen and mm -hmm. it's undeclared. I mean, we got to get to the mom blogs, right? I mean, this is an outcry. I mean, I don't have, I am not a parent of a kid with allergies, but it is paralyzing to think that you might put a spice on dinner where you never expected peanut. That was an economic motivation that has catastrophic public health consequences. Dr. Kirscher, could you talk just along these lines about the need and the level of current public education and the extent to which anyone can empower themselves more effectively to be aware of these challenges and to be more, uh, more sensitive as, as one walks through the marketplace uh, and selects their food? How, how does one become more educated? And, and, and how can they become more empowered? I, we, the media ask me this question all the time. What do we, the consumer, do? And I think it's hard because you're at the end of the supply chain. Everybody else ahead of you has to do their job. But a few things. One, you know, we tell people to buy from reputable sources. Know where your food is coming from. While it's an extreme example, don't buy sirloin steak off the back of a truck for two bucks on the corner of K-State. I don't know if they actually do that, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you know, n buy, f <laughs> buy food from where we think it's produced. Read your label. I challenge you to all go home and read extra virgin olive oil label that you have in your pantry right now. It probably <clears throat> says... Um, produced from, and it gives you five countries. You can't actually tell where the olives are from. Don't buy food from places it probably isn't made. You know, we also have some interesting tariff structures. The number one import site for the U.S. for cocoa is where? Canada. There are no cocoa beans grown in Canada. But the way we've structured taxes and tariffs are that they import it, add enough value to cocoa beans that it now looks like a product of Canada because f over 50% of the origin or value is now related to that Canadian production. So, you know, buy what you buy reputable brands, 
buy, pay the amount of money food should cost, and really challenge, you know, challenge your congressmen, challenge your health departments to really keep you aware of what's happening. So we need to have, we need to demand a better understanding of where our food is grown. And I don't think, you know, I go into schools and talk to kids. They don't know where their food comes from. And I have to tell you, if I read some labels, I can't tell them where their food comes from. Thank you. Dr. Higgs? Oh, yeah. certainly we, <laughs> thank you for that. We certainly have had plenty of rice made of plastic, too, just to hmm. continue with the analogies. <laughs> Dr. Higgs, you wanted to make a comment? No, I was, I was just oh, okay. Yeah. talking about that. Okay. Very good. I, I would like to ask one question. Um, the panel came up with 33 recommendations and then the following report uh, came up with a realization that those had not been um, forcefully put into practice. Um, what next? Am I allowed to ask that question? Absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, what next is I think we have a new administration. We have the potential for new emphasis and energy. Uh, our hope is to, is to release a second series of, of recommendations by the end of the year, but we're going to be putting as much emphasis as we can, as I said, on, on action and on organization, on response in Congress, on working with uh, the new leadership in this administration in an effort to elevate the prioritization of a lot of these issues and to energize, if we will, the, the federal government in particular. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is going to take a concerted effort. It's going to be important that it's not just the Blue Ribbon Study Panel that is calling for this, but that we have allies, as, as Congressman Marshall has, has certainly indicated today, uh, working with us to ensure that we create more of a, an action agenda. But let me ask my colleagues if they'd like to add to that. Ken, would you like to add anything? <laughs> uh, one of the things we, we discovered when we put out our first report um, <clears throat> was that people, people read it, they understood it, um, we didn't get a lot of people come back and say, these are, these are outrageous recommendations, we don't understand. But what we also found was, despite the fact that our action items are really very, very clear in, in terms of identifying exactly which people or which positions need to execute something, what piece of legislation might, not, might need to be amended or, or, or added or subtracted and so forth, despite that, there was still a lack of understanding on how to get beyond that level. Uh, what looks very straightforward to us uh, was not necessarily something that the people who need to execute even knew how to execute. So we may not uh, we may add some recommendations, but we also are adding more granularity to the how. How do you do such and such thing? Um, and, uh, you know, just as one example, we keep talking about funding. Um, so if we made a recommendation that something should re receive additional funding, well, it's an easy thing to say, but it's a complicated situation. The OMB has a role and appropriations have a role and the authorizers have a role and that's just Congress. Never mind all the other people and agencies that have a role. Um, I, we want to take some steps to uh, articulate those further um, uh, articulating process and procedure uh, and connecting dots for people who've never connected them before to see that our recommendations are are better implemented. Okay. If I may, uh, Dr. Higgs, very good question. And, um, you know, it's, uh, we're all, always thinking, what, what are the next steps that need to be pursued? Um, but so as I said in my earlier remarks, foundational to this is having the necessary leadership and coordination of the overall effort. And this is a, a threat that, that needs to be handled by all levels of government, but the reality is the federal government needs to take a stronger leadership role within the federal government and within the whole nation. And that's why um, two of our recommendations, I think, are so important. One, that, that there be a national strategy, which now has been legislatively mandated, which is very important. I think that is a nice, that effort will be a channel by which we can pursue some of the other recommendations but also that within the federal government there be some place in the federal government, and we've recommended that it be, as you said, Dr. Kircher, that it be with the vice president and that there be a focus on uh, having that structure put in place because absent that, just as we saw after 9-11 where there was a need for all the different players to start working together and sort of 
marching in step. I don't think we're going to get that in the bio threat area. And, you know, after 9-11, it was the president himself who really oversaw that effort to try to force the coordination mm. among all the relevant agencies. I mean, literally, President Bush had briefings six days a week, every morning, both to get intelligence, but also to force the, um, the building of a counterterrorism effort that would meet the threat. I think, while we can't have, expect that of the president in the bio area, I think we need that. And that's why we have been so forceful in recommending that it be the vice president. Well, it's a little orthodox, but to be the vice president to do that. And once we get that coordination, which is foundational, I think the, the lesser recommendations or the subordinate recommendations are more likely to be adopted. Okay. If there are no further questions or comment, uh, we'll take a break now for lunch. Um, we will return at uh, 1 o'clock here to take the second panel. Um, one fifteen, I guess. Um, is that yes. right? One fifteen. So thank you very much to both our panelists for just an excellent presentation. Thank you.